Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar. And I'm Tracy McRae. Rhabdomyolysis is a rare condition in which muscle cells break down and release a substance into the blood that can lead to kidney failure. Most often, it's seen in people who have suffered major injuries or trauma. Sometimes, however, it may develop in response to certain medications, dietary supplements, or drugs. In some cases, rhabdomyolysis may affect athletes such as weightlifters and marathon runners. Recently, the University of Oregon suspended the football strength and conditioning coach for one month without pay after three players were hospitalized with rhabdomyolysis following a series of intense workouts. Here to discuss rhabdomyolysis is Mayo Clinic's physiologist and human performance expert, Dr. Michael Joyner. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Joyner. Tracy, great to be with you, Sanj. Nice to see you as well. All right. What is rhabdomyolysis? In, it must be like high-functioning athletes that suffer. Well, I, I think if you go back to the first principles that Sanj elucidated there, it's muscle damage, frequently crush injuries, trauma, as we see in, in car wrecks, uh, people getting rolled over by farm implements, things like that. Sometimes medications, sometimes other strange things that cause skeletal muscle to break down. But what can happen with athletes is people can push themselves very hard, frequently with what we call eccentric exercise. They can overdo it. And if this is amplified by dehydration, they can have a muscle breakdown, and that muscle breakdown will cause the muscles to leak out a substance called myoglobin. The myoglobin is difficult for the kidneys to clear, and in fact gums up the kidneys, and so you get this sort of secondary uh, kidney failure, and that's what happened to these athletes at the University of Oregon. So to join uh, athletics has been around since time immemorial, so is this something new, or are we just better at diagnosing this? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, I think we're better at diagnosing it, but I also think it has been around forever, and there are case reports that go back, back forever, military recruits and so forth, uh, for long, long periods of time, since the beginning of the medical literature, really. And I think what's happened now with so much high-intensity training uh, uh, in and the emergence of the strength and conditioning coaches, it's easy for people to overdo it. In cases where rhabdomyolysis is seen, wh what frequently happens is a pretty, pretty common series of events. A lot of times it occurs after an elite or a highly trained athlete's had a bit of a layoff and people come back with a square wave doing the workout they had been doing, oh. and it's a whole lot harder than they thought. Sometimes it's in a group environment where people are pushing each other and it's highly competitive. Sometimes it's an overzealous coach. Uh, pushing things. Sometimes it's a combination of all those things in dehydration, either pre-existing or a warm environment. And then uh, sometimes it's the type of exercise, again, a lot of negative contractions or eccentric contractions and uh, things like up-downs, uh, too many burpees, uh, and certain types of weightlifting. Has there that ever happened to you, Dr. Kakar, well, too many burpees? I don't even know what an up-down is. I've never <laughs> heard of that before. Well, then I think you and I are safe. But that's I was just going to ask. Someone, you know, that's just training for their first marathon or, you know, they're kind of a weekend sports right. person, they can have problems with rhabdomyolysis Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, they can. And, again, it's the same sort of thing, a sudden increase in the intensity and duration of the exercise, frequently warm weather or pre-existing dehydration. Uh and so what people need to do, whenever you take a big jump up, you know, you build into it slowly and make things progressive. You can tolerate almost anything if you build into hmm. it. And how common is it? Is it the fact that we're all just trying to work a lot harder? Is that why we're hearing about it more? Or is it really not that common? I think it's pretty uncommon. Uh, but I do think you, you see it, again, with these sorts of crush injuries and in response to trauma. But I think you see it, you know, at the time of, of spring football, the beginning of practice, uh, when the weather is warm, and it seems to kind of come and go uh, in waves. And then in the current environment, uh, you know, anything that happens anywhere in the world sure. uh, gets reported and ends up, you know, on the front page of some place right. where it used to be in the back page, you know, three weeks ago this happened in Australia. So, Dr. Joyner, many of our uh, listeners have just uh, we're in February, have had their New Year's resolution, they're going to hit the gym and hit it hard. Are they at risk of getting rhabdomyolysis? Potentially they are. There's one fascinating case report in the medical literature of somebody who'd been an elite athlete and actually had a, an advanced degree in exercise science who decided one day to see how many pull-ups they could do, and they did repeated sets of pull-ups, and there are these incredible reports of huge spikes in his creatine kinase, which is a marker of muscle breakdown over time. So even people that should know better are susceptible for, to this. And I think the thing people have to ask themselves, whether they're elite athletes, whether they're people just trying to get fitter, A, what is the purpose of this workout? 
in the short run. B, what are your goals? And C, is this a sustainable program? Mm. So people, if you're going to be get fitter over time, whether you're training for the Olympics or you're training to lose five pounds so you look a little bit better at the beach, the goal should be to develop a sustainable program, which means it needs to be graded, needs to be progressive, and you have to have a combination of harder days and easier days. Ease your way into the workout. Yes, and that's true whether whether you're somebody training for the Olympic marathon after a, a you know a few weeks sure. off or an injury, or again whether you're somebody uh, you know who's participating in cardiac rehab or or trying to uh, you know improve their diabetes management. What are so I'm not quite sure when someone has rhabdomyolysis, do they present the same way at the emergency room or do they just collapse? What happens to them? Well, they certainly can collapse and you certainly can see it with severe heat stress. But frequently uh, people uh, get an acute kidney failure. They have uh, this sort of uh, strange, dark colored urine, tremendous skeletal muscle soreness. And that's what people would look for and how they would present. And they just feel terrible. And is the muscle damage permanent? You talked about the creatinine kinase levels going up. No, the muscle damage is not permanent. And in fact, even if you do a moderate workout or a reasonably hard workout that doesn't put your health at any risk, you will see small spikes in your creatinine kinase. And that's actually a good thing because when you adapt, it's, a, it's, it's really a, a, almost a subclinical or a micro injury followed by repair, which makes your skeletal muscles hypertrophy and makes you stronger over time. So that's not anything per se to be worried about. It's just when it becomes severe and debilitating when you run into problems. And as you've said, the best way to prevent it is just to ease into a workout, to not do these big, oh, I was doing this three months ago before I yes. wrecked my you know, knee or whatever. Or took time off yeah. for Christmas or whatever it is. Sure. And, and I think, again, people need to always ask themselves, what is the purpose of this workout? What is the purpose of this workout? And and I can't imagine the purpose of any workout being to destroy your skeletal muscles so badly that you damage your kidneys. What so, is the purpose of your workout? Uh, you know, I, I used to be a serious competitive athlete, but now I've, I've tried to gotten in. I'm 58 and a half, and I've gotten into sort of an anti-aging program mm -hmm. where I focus a lot on some cardiovascular fitness because I want to keep that as high as mm -hmm. possible. A lot more on muscle mass, especially lower extremity muscle mass than I used to with, with squats and um, leg press and, and burpees of my own, mm -hmm. jumping rope. And then I also focus on coordination because as Sanjal Tay is an orthopedic surgeon, one of the things, and I'm an anesthesiologist, we hate to see more than anything on call is an older person who's slipped and has broken a bone, especially a hip, sometimes a spine, pelvis, arm, upper extremity. And you want to stay as coordinated as possible for as long as possible so that if you do start to slip on the ice, you can catch yourself, regain your balance, and not fall. For me, I'm just thinking stress release, but, uh, stress relief, but I think I should probably count a few more of those. How about you, Sanj? I'm just thinking uh, it's 30 minutes. When does it get to zero? And then I can stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's one of the things you can do with these fancy new watches is put, the, put them on countdown mode. And so that 30 minutes will maybe go a little bit faster. Just like that, Dr. Katkar. Just like that. <laughs> We've been discussing rhabdomyolysis with Dr. Michael Joyner, human performance expert. Thank you so much for joining us. It was good to see you. Great to be here. And that's our program for this week.